All righty, Larry Mack here, and I'm here once again talking with Robert Mason of Warrant. Hey, good morning, man. Thanks a lot for uh, getting up so early and uh, hanging out with me on a, on a uh, for you and me Saturday. Other people may be watching this at another time. Exactly. Top of the, uh, for me, it's a California Riverside County morning on that uh, lovely venue that we're performing this evening. But yeah, you and I have uh, have a lot to talk about. So first of all, let's get uh, this information out there right away. If you didn't know, Warrant is going to be back in Tucson on Friday, June 21st at the uh, Tucson Fox Theater. And it's the the Let the Good Times Rock Tour with uh, Lita Ford and yep. uh, Gavin Evick. Is that his name? I, I'm not real too familiar right. with him. Yeah, that's right. This is this is all news to me. Like we knew Lita's on the bill because that's it's what I see on my handy dandy uh, device here on my Tour Master app. But yeah. So Gavin is uh, the progeny of uh, of Pete Evick. If it's the same Gavin Evick, I mean, I know his, I know his kid's name is Gavin, a uh, singer, guitar player, songwriter guy, and uh, he's uh, he's a talented young cat. But Pete plays for Brett Michaels. Oh, okay, so that's uh, Pete uh, Brett's uh, touring guitar, so he's not with Poison. Correct. The okay. BMP, the mighty Brett Michaels band. Correct. Yeah, and Brett is going to be, uh, I, I believe, in town in October doing his Brett Michaels Party Gras. Correct. Yes, the, so, the Party Gras, um, where he brings it. He started that last year, right? Bring yeah. It in, uh, he brings in a couple of he, ringers to sing their hits and, and then does the big Brett Michaels band thing. We play with Brett several times throughout the year. He and I are friends, like actual friends, not just, you know. Well, I would I would think so. Besides the industry uh, thing, you both, you know, have had homes in the Phoenix area. Yeah. And so I would presume you guys would run into each other as, you know, you and I met in Phoenix way in, in the dark ages before the Tour Master app. I was thinking about that and all the stuff that, that like, how many of these have we done? Not Zoom, obviously, but. Like, tons of interviews over the years yeah like even showing up or doing phone interviews and stuff so it was yeah i my hair was blonde not white uh, yours was I, yours was not I, on was, your face it was on top of my head oh, it, 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 it's just, you know, but as long as it lands somewhere if it slides down as long as it lands somewhere well you know let's uh before we get in there i have to, I, I have to look, give you a little bit quite a good look for you well thank you man i i, I learned it from rob halford so <laughs> another so. neighbor Another I was, uh, you know, it was so funny back in the day uh, when I was at uh, Z Rock. I, I walked in, I had shaved my head, and my yep. program director at the time was very upset. He goes, Guys at metal stations don't have shaved heads. Then every band throughout the 90s had one dude with a shaved head and a goatee. So, <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, Hey, you know, so New Year's Eve, you guys played on that very cold night in downtown Tucson. You guys put on a fantastic show, by the way. Sure. And we rang in the new year, but it was so funny. Uh, I always tell people about this. I go, so then Robert calls me out on stage about what's the B side of cherry pie. And I'm looking at him like, dude, back in those days, I didn't get 45s. I got CD pros because I was in radio. So like, we didn't know the what the side of this. Yeah. And then you're like, Larry, don't, don't flick your beard. Like you like, <laughs> so you're like <laughs> taking a pregnant pause to think as if you know the answer. And then you had no clue. And I'm sitting there and then you went into it. I'm like, well, and you know, on the top of it, I had my phone with me, and I'm like, I could Wikipedia, but he will call me on that one too. <laughs> well, yeah, I I see most. I don't see all, but I see most from up there. If there's a, if there's not a follow spot like obscuring my view of the crowd, but dude, you were the perfect foil because I caught you out there. I saw you. Like, <laughs> Damn it, I can name drop Larry Mack right now. It was it was <laughs> hilarious, and I'm sitting here like this, and wife is sitting here looking at me. She goes, Yeah, he's really giving you a hard time, and I go, Yes, he is. <laughs> I'm really not, but you know. No, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. It's, yeah. I always uh, hearken that stuff back to, uh, do you remember uh, the old Happy Days episode with Richie Cunningham when he knew the rock star, but he couldn't tell anybody that he knew the rock star? And so nobody believed him. And then he's way up in the nosebleed seats. And then the rock star shouts out to him. And everybody goes, and Fonz goes, hey. <laughs> Ah, oh my gosh yeah memory jog but yeah it was way back i always remember that episode and so that kind of reminds me goes hey uh robert called me out from stage put me on a spot but hey it was <laughs> oh it's entertainment no it was fun it was a lot of fun and, and i'm looking forward to seeing you guys have you toured with lita before we play a bunch of shows we uh we have a common booking agent so Throughout the year, we play a bunch of shows with Lita and her band, and they're all cool. She's great. She lives uh, 
in Arizona, not not anywhere near me, but somewhere you know in the in the valley area. Yeah. So I see her at our airport now. I'll see her in the in the Sky Club. We're all flying Delta in the morning. It's like oh dark thirty, and she you know gets in there with you know with whoever she's traveling with, and I'm like hey, it just actually I was sitting there with my coffee one morning, just dead to the world because I had, it was a, probably we we're boarding at like five ish in the morning for a six a.m. flight to get somewhere, and. I, I'm in line in the Sky Club getting my coffee and I, I'm walking back and I hear, hey, and I'm like, oh, and it's, you know, and it's Lena behind me, like, you know, in her all all black in a hoodie, but you can tell it's her, like with her yeah. mother's sunglasses, she goes, hey, good morning. And I'm like, holy shit, you're the crap out of me, Lena. Well, you, know, you know, it's interesting. You talk about that, you know, like 530 in the morning, 6 a.m., you're at an airport and, you know, to the average person out there, they think the rock star <laughs> life is so glamorous. And yeah. I've gotten to meet a few of the people on your side of the business. And, you know, I listen to the stories. I go, yeah, you get to travel. You get to do all this. But a lot of times you're in one city, then you're getting ready for the next. And you get a sound check. Like, you're, you're really busy constantly. And if you're not busy, you're traveling. The travel is the only part, I think, that can get on our nerves. I mean, I'm, I'm not, this is not like a, you know, not like a commercial or an advertisement. It's not fantasy. That's my commute to work like so if you slug it out on the freeway with you know with so many other people just to get to your office or, or your job or wherever that is and throughout the day like you deal with that rush hour whatever yeah i wake up at two whatever time zone i'm in or earlier sometimes in the morning you know that's when your day starts your alarm rings you're like oh you know if you're in a hotel it's like shower vans race to an airport hopefully get a little something to eat or relax and then you're on a plane or two or three to either go to work or come home or to go to your next show from the last show i'm, I'm not bitching by any means because i love my i really oh, yeah. do love my job. but the thing that everyone else finds this this is the here's the tie-in the things that everyone else finds exciting like packing your luggage i'm going on a trip i'm going you know like you're going to in hawaii or you're going to whatever you know if you feel on the east coast you're going to disney world whatever you're doing like even growing up as a kid those things are for a traveling salesman which is basically what i am those are the things that you become accustomed to that you have to do for your work and you know like a delay in a flight or crap weather and you're sitting in an airport for how many hours before you actually get on a plane to then go to your next city then you go there and you a new hotel like I have, I have to take self, thank God for these things. I have to take cell phone pictures sometimes of the hotel door to know what room number I am. Cause I'll, I will get in the elevator and go to floor six instead of floor eight and oh, walk yeah. right up to my yesterday's hotel number and go, Oh, th this is yesterday. Sorry. And I have to go back to my room. Um, it's not that I have a terrible memory, but it's, it's, it's that cliche of like, what city am I am in today to go to work? Well, I would also think too that you know, uh, you know, you were talking about delays, uh, you know, weather delays, stuff like that. You know, for for most people when they're flying and stuff like that, the delay means that they just don't get to Disney World on time. <laughs> for you, you you guys, it could cause your show to be delayed. Yeah, right. Exactly. Everything runs you know uphill towards the culmination of your entire day, which is getting on stage so and as a singer i have a little bit more maybe precaution to take and i have to be take it easy and i you know i don't, I don't drink so and i'm not a i've never been a drug guy so for me i was i was raised an athlete but and maybe that gives me somewhat of an advantage to be kind of a little bit more together by the time i have to go to work but uh but yeah man it's it's funny because everything leads to that I sometimes refer to it to friends or people that don't understand your job. Like, what do you do? You know, then I don't, half the time I don't want to tell them. But if they ask, it's like the 22 and a half hours of total BS to get on stage for an hour and a half, you know, mm -hmm. and everything else is just that, that other time, which is hotels, a workout, the shower, warming up, show prep, all that stuff that leads up to, like I said, your day schedule from that wake up at, Oh, dark 30 in the morning, whenever that might be to be able to do the flights, do the van rides, do the, whatever that all leads up to, you know, we're sitting in the dressing room and everybody's warming up and I go, I'm, I'm always wearing a watch. I'm like, 
eight minutes. And that's like eight minutes till the time the intro tape runs. Or Joey will go like, it, it's funny. He's, he's like, Mason, what time is it? You know, because he's been noodling and warming up and everybody's getting ready. And we're all, you know, the five of us and very few other people, if ever. We lock down the dressing room the last little bit before the show and kind of get that last little bit of, you know, bonding and, and all that stuff off stage. And then we do the walk up all leads up to that moment where the lights go on, you know, do you, but it's, do you, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, please. So you've been, how long have you been in Warren now? Uh, since September of 2008. So what does that make it almost 16 years? Okay. So do you still, I mean, you've been a musician for a long time. You've been a, a singer in multiple bands over the years. So you are, you know, this is your life. But do you still, you know, you're talking about that warm up, right? Do you still, do you, do, you, do you get butterflies before? No, it's not that I'm blasé to it at all. It's that, and it's always been this, it's weird. Short of the first couple of years of ever doing it, like being completely nervous, like, well, how do I do this? Which is an interesting story. It happened almost by accident, uh, by default almost. But, uh, but if anything, it's anxiousness. Like I keep looking at my watch because I want to go to work. Like all the other stuff is just stuff in, in that moment of the last few minutes to get ready. And then you're focused on the job. And I don't mean it in a bad way. It's a job. It's like, I love my job. I can't wait to go do my job. You know, how do you keep your voice as, in shape? I mean, you're physically in shape. I've seen you, you know, dude, you make me pissed off and I see you take your shirt off. And, uh, <laughs> but I mean, how do you keep, because the hey, vocals, I get sweaty. these things bother me, you, but how do you, how do you, how do you get that? Because, you know, I, I, I've seen other singers in, in the genre. I've seen other singers over the years. In fact, I just watched the Hulu John Bon Jovi special all about mm -hmm. losing his voice, the whole thing. How do you keep all. your voice in shape? Uh, part of it is just the luck of genetics and you never know your propensity for how long your voice is going to last. Like you could, you know, you could end up being Tony Bennett or, you know, or not. Yep. Uh, and that's partially due to just, like I said, the stuff you can't control, but I think there's so many elements that you can. And I didn't grow up, I like never been a smoker, anything ever. Uh, maybe that has something to do with it. I was a swimmer and, and an athlete. I ran and played sports. So maybe my lungs are a little more, you know, leathered up and, and bulletproof. Um, and I learned, I when I got really serious about this in my early, very early 20s, I tried looking for a uh, vocal teacher. Okay. And found the first couple of like traditional opera teacher types. I grew up in the New York area. So I'm in, this is New Jersey, everywhere from like Connecticut, New York city, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. I searched around to try to find like the great vocal teacher. I didn't have a lot of money though. You know, there were, there are a couple of marquee vocal teachers that everybody goes to John among them. Uh, and they're like the, like Marty Lawrence and his, uh, is it Don and Marty? Don Lawrence and his son, Marty, or the other way around. I don't know. I've never met either one of them, Katie Gresta. They're all like the East Coast Mark, uh, Mark Baxter up in Boston, who apparently worked with like the cars and Aerosmith and all those people. Couldn't afford those guys. And I found a vocal teacher uh, who was a soprano at the Met as a kid. She went to Juilliard when she was in her, like, she was prodigal. Her grandfather was Fiorella LaGuardia. Oh, wow. Uh, so that was her maiden name. Uh, but she had retired and was just teaching locally in, you know, and everybody around in the bands I was, I was in and, and surrounded by said, you know, go see her. And she was super cool. She realized she was the first teacher that realized that I wanted to be a rock kid and not a traditional opera, but she had been at Juilliard. So, and had sung in USO shows in the fifties and sixties, like, tons of real cool stuff and smoky jazz bars in new york city so she had worn all the shoes you know what i mean metaphorically that i that i wanted to try to get to big venues small venues all that stuff and she treated me really really well and taught me that stuff and so learning that stuff i learned how to do it properly without burning my throat up in my early 20s and then cultivated that and, and I still to this day do warm-ups that she taught me to do and it's 
there's the world is your oyster now. You can go on YouTube, you know, and learn right. everything there is to know. But back then it just wasn't that way. And I had opera teachers refuse because I didn't want to sing in Italian and wear a tuxedo. You know what I mean? Like you're wasting this talent you have and you're, you know, gonna burn your voice out with all those idol. I re and they didn't want to teach me or they had an attitude about it. And I walked out of a couple of instructors, little studios, you know, a couple of times before I found her. Oh, that's fantastic though. And, and she taught you a lot. Yeah. Oh, instrumental. And back then I was in a mostly cover band, half original kind of thing doing, you know, three and four sets a night for six nights a week. So it was trial by fire. And, and granted, I'm in my twenties. I could heal overnight, even if I, you know, hurt my throat, but I didn't want to, I wanted to learn to do this long haul and, you know, wow, who knew? And, and here you are all these years later, yeah. still doing it. Class of 82. Uh, it's funny. Eric Turner, Joey Allen, and myself all turned 60 this year. No. Yeah, 64 babies. Wow. Yeah, class of 82. Yeehaw. Class of 83. Class so, of 83. Yeah. Well, you know, you and I met way back when, I think it was the Electric Ballroom. You introduced me to yourself mm -hmm. uh, as the new singer of Lynch Mob. Yeah, like um, 90. One maybe was, I think it was 9091. So I, I remember the moment we met. We were on the other side of the electric ballroom. It's weird how you can remember meeting certain people, you know. And uh we had a pleasant conversation and gotten to know know each other over the years. But for those who who you know know you as the singer of Warrant, uh I met you as the singer of uh Lynch Mob. Give us a brief little history of Robert Mason's professional you know, rock star resume, you know. Uh, hardly call it that. I'm just a guy in a band, but, um, like I said, in the New York area, very, very early twenties, I, uh, was part of a band that didn't even have a name at the time. I was slugging around New York and, and the surrounding area, trying to get in a band, get a record deal, that sort of thing. I'd been through the, the cover band, made a couple of records and done some sessions. I was lucky enough to get in some like recording sessions for things, doing background vocals or singing a song or two here and there for hire, uh, thankfully in that environment, and then go into some jams. Uh, if you know, well, you know who Joel and Turner is. Mm -hmm. uh, you kids out there, Joel and Turner, fantastic singer, New Jersey native. I looked up to him a lot and I met him uh, in a rehearsal studio in New Jersey on an evening rehearsing with one of my first bands ever. And I mean, I saw him in the hallway going to, you know, hit the water fountain or whatever in between, you know, on a band break. And literally Joe comes up to me, he goes, Hey kid, I hear you in there. Are you, you're singing? I'm like, yeah. It's like, and he puts his hand and says, Hey, I'm Joe Lynn. I'm like, yeah, I kind of know that. You <laughs> I, know? Know who you I, was, are. I was like super <laughs> introverted and giant. I'm like, not, you know, I'm, it's not, I'm, I'm not the guy you see on stage. I'm really, really laid back and really kind of, I'm quiet, you know, and I'm not like yelling and that's not who I am. He's like, hey man, I'm Joe Lynn. It's like, yeah, no, I know I'm Robert. Hey, nice to meet you. And we exchanged numbers and he, you know, the short, the short version is he took me into these environments in New York city. We'd go to little Italy, go out dinner and a bottle of wine. And then we'd go to these jams in the city and it would be these, immense talent pools imagine between like the guys that play in letterman's band and and the saturday night live band wow and all the session players and like liberty from billy joel's band would like sit in on drums or chuck burgie or like one of those guys with hollow notes like and it would be a jam where you'd be like that's elliot randall he's a guitar player and steely dan like and I would get thrown in these environments and the guest singers would be like on any given night, it could be Michael Bolton, Paul Stanley, Joe Lynn, a couple of session singers and me. And Joe was the guy who introduced me to those people just, you know, several times going, Oh, put the kid up there, put the kid up there to sing, you know? And you're in that environment where you're like, that that's, you're cutting heads. If you suck, you're not invited back. Wow. Like, to play with like, you know, like the guys that you see on TV in the Saturday Night Live band, and then the Uptown Horns, and like all these people you go like, was, was hey. G Daily part of that too? Um, oh, what's oh, the name? G Smith. G Smith. Sorry, G yeah, Smith. G. Yeah, 
Yep. He would go to uh, Outlaw Guitars in New Jersey and steal vintage guitars out from under me several times. He, he was like buying up cool guitars. All. He's, I, w I had my eye on a 57 Les Paul one year and, his, and I came in and my buddy Steve was, uh, was running the store and he's like, it was a lot of money and I wasn't going to be able to afford it. But I, but it's like that. It was totally the Wayne's world with the white strat. It's like, Oh yes, it will be mine. You know, like that thing. <laughs> and then it was gone. And like, Oh, GE came in and bought that. And he bought this and he bought three, you know, the other, and he was like, damn it. G e. Smith, you got all that money. Um, but yeah, I would like walk up and go, Hey, do you guys know? Oh, darling by the Beatles. And just look like a total idiot. Cause every session musician would roll their eyes. and like, go ahead, go ahead, take the mic, you know, <laughs> so from that environment to like i said slugging it out in a couple of bands that were trying for a record deal uh i was in a band that had a development deal on epic sony and uh signed by the head of a and r who had just like resurrected and been instrumental in the resurgence of the careers of both like heart and cheap trick oh wow he was a wonderful guy so they would give you money and you'd write more songs. They look, you know, this is, this is the, the A&R guy saying, we see promise, but we, it's not there yet. And then they would give you development money. So we went and recorded a bunch of songs. And that's when I met all the guys in Firehouse who were recording their same, with the same producer, their first record. Oh, wow. So I met them in 88, 89, doing that. Uh, that record deal development deal kind of fell through because uh don the president of a and r moved on moved out of the sony family and it was taken as standard story you're like in your 20s and you get you know ooh, we have a record deal and you, you don't all of a sudden you know because a new president of a and r moves in and he's got his baby bands so that was my first taste of that then i heard lynch mob was auditioning and uh just through phone calls and like, I guess it had been in all the magazines or whatever. I had somebody turn me onto it and I called a friend uh, that I had met. I'm, I'm fast forwarding a little bit about a, a year or a little less than a year uh, while showcasing with these bands and trying to get something going on in New York and not having anything uh, fruitful really happen from it. Got the opportunity to audition for Lynch Mob and I just kind of went for it and flew out to Phoenix and auditioned and got that gig. Not immediately. I've told this story a bunch of times. Yeah, yeah. But I'm encapsulating it, you know. So I get that gig and it's my first big, you know, ooh, we have a deal on Electra and it's all based in LA. You have to move to Phoenix. So, you know, and that's what that's what brought me there. And then but, you I mean, were I've been doing this since I was probably in my very early twenties, straight out of college. And, and um, you know, you were just talking to uh before we went live, we were talking a little bit about, you know, changes in the industry. And one of the things and you brought it up at the beginning of the conversation, you were talking about the tour app and mm -hmm. it seems like, you know, this, what we're doing right now would have never happened when we first met. It would have had to been a phone call. I would have had to record it on tape and, and do the whole thing. And here I am in my office at my house, you're in California, in a hotel room. And, you know, and, and now you even have this other technology to help you get through your day, um, through your business. Well, exactly. So the Tour Master app is anybody who plays music understands this. Uh, so years ago, when you'd start a tour or be on tour or whatever, like we used to go on bus tours or, you know, you're flying around and then buses and all over the world. You would, prior to the tour or beginning, in the beginning, uh, your tour manager would hand you either a binder or, you know, a little notebook or whatever, that they would have all of your dates for that run whether it be, you know, a year, two months, a week, you know, six weeks, whatever. And so you'd have a physical thing that you, you know, don't lose this because this is everything you need to know. And then you get day sheets, you know, you'd be in a hotel or in, in a bus or whatever, you'd wake up and there would be a sheet under your door with that day's itinerary. Uh, all that is on this tour master app now because of the smartphones. Amazing. And so when you ask me like, so what's, where are you going to be? Where are you? I'm like, hold on. I have an answer for that. It's right here, you know. And plus, the, dude, the fox. I'm so stoked. And, and, and I'm pretty sure, too, that can give you immediate changes where before they'd have to copy it, get it to the band, and take another hour to get it to you. Now it's immediate, probably with a warning, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. There's very, there's very little left to chance as long as you, uh, you know, the, the, 
the cliche, the, the meme is, have you checked tour master yet? You know, don't talk to me till you've looked at your tour master app. That's what our, uh, your TM tells you, your tour manager. I'm like, you know, where are we staying in like three weeks? It's in the app. Just look. Well, let's talk about the show. Uh, it's going to be Friday, June 21st over at the Fox Theater. Uh, you know, I, I haven't seen a lot of rock shows at the Fox Theater, but lately they've been bringing a lot of rock shows. And, and you know, I saw Night Ranger recently, and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys on the 21st of June. Um, have you ever played there before? Never. That was, you're reading my mind, Larry Mack. Uh, I've wanted to play there between the Rialto and the Fox. Like, I, we'd never played the Fox. And I just had to read up on all the all the history, which I thought was so cool the other day. You know, you can go to Wikipedia now and read mostly true stuff about mostly everything. Uh, but it's a such it's got such great history, and the community came in and really stepped up to rebuild it back in the day. And now it's you know, and, and, and it's one of those things when you have when you're blessed to be able to go do this for a living. Like this is my job, unbelievable. You know, no matter how well or doesn't well pay at times or whatever, I am truly as thankful as can be because I just love singing. I was telling somebody just the other day, and I, I say this a lot, like just the act of singing I like. It's almost like it doesn't matter what, you know, it could be a Pringles commercial, you know, as a session in, in my house, in my studio at home in Cave Creek. And then like you email it out, you know, and that's how, you know, some people make money that way. Um but I love getting on my side of a microphone and having an audience on the other side. And at its core, like at its most primal core, I love to do that. I have my entire life. Even when I was a little kid, I didn't realize it yet that this was even a thing. And I remember being like eight or nine and seeing Tom Jones on TV going, Oh my God, that, you know what I mean? Like I didn't realize that women were throwing their panties at him at that point. I'm like a little kid <laughs> that came later. Uh and I'm like, I, didn't, I really want to do that job. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like being able to play these historically significant places, that's my point, is like really cool. And I'd never played the Fox. So we're, I, I mean, I'm over the moon about it. Yeah, the acoustics in there are fantastic. You're going to have a blast there. I'm looking forward to seeing the show. What can people expect um, from a Warrant show if, if they have not seen Warrant in years? Uh, or maybe you've never seen the band, but are fans of the music. Well, if you know the songs, there are the ones that we, you know, we couldn't get out of the room without playing and and causing, you know, people to be unhappy if we don't play whatever. Uh, but we're, you know, we're on stage for roughly about an hour and a half. And, and it's, you know what, it's, I was a fan. And people that know a little bit about the band know that Lynch Mob opened for Warrant back in the day in arenas. And that was when, uh, I think while we were both making our records, when I was making that Lynch Mob record in 91, 92, and then uh, Warrant was making Dog Eat Dog. Janie and I met at the FM station in Hollywood, in North Hollywood, uh, when we were both making those records. They had, I think they were on a break and he was uh, home from, from Tampa, I think where they were, Tampa, Orlando, they were making the record in Florida with uh, Michael Wagner at the time. And he and I met in, in a bar, in a club in oh, Hollywood. Wow. And I was on a night off. Like, I, I think I was just hanging out and had to get in the studio the next day. And we met and became fast friends and, you know, a couple of really funny conversations and perhaps a shot or two of tequila later. It was kind of intimated to me, like, you know, and I... Promised is the wrong word, but he's like, you know, I have a record coming out. You, you know, it's our third record. You have a record coming out. You're kind of brand new in, in this area in the industry. Kind of took me under his wing. He's like, you're going to open for us. Oh, wow. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. whatever. Yeah. And, but, you know, even then I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I've been down this road once or twice. Look, you know, don't promise. Don't write any checks you can't cash, you know. But it happened. And just through dumb luck, like uh, Lynch Mob had a bunch of kiss dates that I'm sitting in Scottsdale in my apartment our record was ready to come out and I see all this tour stuff come from our management company you know faxes just reams of paper coming out I'm like oh you know these this these whatever dates with kiss I'm like I, you know that was one of my first concerts at Madison Square Garden when I was a kid like oh no this is happening we're going to play all these places and then they're their management and their tour, their tour got changed and we got 
it was like here today, gone later today. Like those dates were just poof, vanished into the ether. And I was like, oh no, what are we going to do? And um, then I got word, you know, we're going to play some theaters and stuff like that on our own. And we brought out uh, the band Life, Sex and Death with us for a little while. And then we got a bunch of warrant dates to support that record. So we really got to be friendly. You know, Lane and I would go out we would ditch our bands and get in a cab and go out and have fun after shows and, you know, come back barely for bus call at one, two, three in the morning and then, you know, roll to the next city. So we got to be friendly there. I knew the guys, um, you know, a bit like you, you know, as you do mm-hmm. on with other bands and they were really cool to us. They were really, really nice to us. And Janie and I were friendly. So that's what brings me back to the warrant camp, you know? So I did that, um, what was your question? I've had a lot of coffee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no problem, man. Uh, no, uh, well, you know, what can people expect? On, what on, can people on, expect? Yeah. Okay. So, like I said, if you're a fan, they're the songs, you know, you kind of know by heart or remember from the back in the MTV days. But a lot of this stuff, Janie was a great songwriter. I mean, I've done two records with the band. We'll do a little of that material. But, I mean, it's, I love being on stage with these guys. And it's five guys on stage for the same reason, you know, all to have fun and to celebrate these songs. and the fact that people still show up and want to come out and remember that time. If you live through it the first time, if you're like, you know, our age, uh, it's a, it's a cool nostalgia memory kick. And I love seeing that in fans where I can be a part, like one of, you know, a fifth of the part that makes them remember stuff that they, you know, fond memories. And if you first heard, cherry pie on a movie soundtrack or in a commercial or something like that or you know or an mtv or whatever is a replay or whatever you know or the classic rock how's that classic rock now Isn't yeah, it is rock what the hell well you know what you guys are going to be here on june 21st with uh lita ford and you're going to be at the fox theater let the good times rock tour with gavin evick opening okay. up so three bands, it's going to be a night of great rock and roll. If people want to follow you guys on social media or on a, the website, how can they do that? It's Warrant Rocks on everything, every platform. Warrant so, Rocks. Every, okay, so warrantrocks.com and Warrant every Rocks. Place, every place you look at stupid memes or, uh, you know, DM your your friends or fans or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's it's Warrant Rocks everywhere. My, uh, my personal ones are Robert Mason Vox VOX. And look for the blue check mark. And I don't even know if I have one of those. I'm, I'm not like, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Well, I want to thank Robert Mason from Warrant. And they're going to be at the Fox Theater along with Lita Ford and Gavin Evick on Friday night, June 21st at the Fox Theater. Get your tickets at klpx.com. Awesome. Thank you, Larry. I really appreciate it.